This is the second half of Book 2, Chapter 9 in 1984. But when war became literally continuous, it also ceases to be dangerous. When war is continuous, there is no such thing as military necessity. Technical progress can cease as, and the most palatable facts can be denied or disregarded. As we've seen, researchers that could be called scientific are still carried out for the purposes of war, but they are essentially a kind of daydreaming, and their failure to show results is not important. Efficiency, even military efficiency, is no longer needed. Nothing is efficient in Oceania except the thought police. Since each of the three superstates is unconquerable, each is in effect a separate universe within, almost, within, within which almost any perversion of thought can be safely practiced. Reality only exerts its pressure through the needs of everyday life, the need to eat and drink, to get shelter and clothing, to avoid swallowing poison or stepping out of top story windows and the like. Between life and death and between physical pleasure and physical pain, there is still a distinction, but that is all. Cut off from contact with the outer world and with the, with the past, the citizen of Oceana is like a man in interstellar space who has no way of knowing which direction is up and which is down. The rulers of such a state are absolute, as the pharaohs or the Caesars could not be. They are obliged to prevent their followers from starving to death in numbers large enough to be inconvenient, and they are obliged to remain at the same low level of military technique as their rivals. But once that minimum is achieved, they can twist reality into whatever shape they choose. The war, therefore, if we judge it by the standards of previous wars, is merely an imposture. It is like the battles between certain ruminant animals whose horns are set at such an angle that they are incapable of hurting one another. But though it is unreal, it is not meaningless. It eats up the surplus of consumable goods, and it helps to preserve the special mental atmosphere that a hierarchical society needs. War, it will be seen, is now a purely internal affair. In the past, the ruling groups of all countries, although they might recognize their common interest and therefore limit the destructiveness of war, did fight against one another, and the victor always plundered the vanquished. In our one own day, they are not fighting against one another at all. The war is waged by each ruling group against its own subjects, and the object of war is not to make or prevent conquest of territory, but to keep the structure of society intact. The very word war, therefore, has become misleading. It would probably be accurate to say that by becoming continuous, war has ceased to exist. The peculiar pressure that it exerted on human beings between the Neolithic age and the early 20th century has disappeared and has been replaced by something quite different. The effect would be much the same as if the three superstates, instead of fighting one another, should agree to live in perpetual peace, and each inviolate within its own boundaries. For, in that case, each would still be a self-contained universe, freed forever from the sobering influence of external danger. A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace. Winston stopped reading for a moment. Somewhere in the remote distance, a rocket bomb thundered. The blissful feeling of being alone with the forbidden book in a room with no telescreen had not worn off. Solitude and safety were the physical sensations, mixed up somehow with the tiredness of his body, the softness of the chair, the touch of the faint breeze from the window that played upon his cheek. The book fascinated him, or more exactly, it reassured him. In a sense, it told him nothing was new, but that was, but that was part of the attraction. It said what he would have said, if it had been possible for him to set his scattered thoughts in order. It was the product of a mind similar to his own, but enormously more powerful, more systematic, less fear-ridden. The best books he perceived are those that tell you what you already know. He had just turned back to chapter one when he heard Julia's footsteps on the stair and started out, out of his chair to meet her. She dumped her brown tool bag on the floor and flung herself into his arms. It was more than a week since they had seen one another. I've got the book, he said as they disentangled themselves. Oh, you got it? Good, she said without much interest and almost immediately knelt down beside the oil stove to make the coffee. They did not return to the subject until they had been in bed for half an hour. The evening was just cool enough to make it worthwhile to pull up the counterpane. From below came the familiar sound of singing and the scrape of boots on the flagstones. The brawny, red-armed woman whom Winston had seen there on his first visit was almost a fixture in the yard. There seemed to be no hour of daylight when she was not marching to and fro between the washtub and the line, alternately gagging herself with clothes pegs and breaking forth into lusty song. Julia had settled down on her side and seemed to be already on the point of falling asleep. He reached out for the book, which was lying on the floor. He sat up against the bedhead. We must read it, he said. You too. All members of the Brotherhood have to read it. You read it, she said with her eyes shut. Read it aloud. That's the best way. Then you can explain it to me as you go. The clock's hands said six, meaning eighteen. They had three or four hours ahead of them. He propped the book against his knees and began reading. Chapter one. Ignorance is strength. 
Throughout recorded time, and probably since the end of the Neolithic Age, there have been three kinds of people in the world, the high, the middle, and the low. They have been subdivided in many ways. They have borne countless different names, and their relative numbers, as well as their attitude toward one another, have varied from age to age, but the essential structure of society has never altered. Even after enormous upheavals and seemingly irrevocable changes, the same pattern has always reasserted itself, just as a gyroscope will always return to equilibrium, however far it is pushed one way or the other. Julia, are you awake? said Winston. Yes, my love, I'm listening. Go on, it's marvelous, he continued reading. The aims of these three groups are entirely irrecon irreconcilable. The aim of the high is to remain where they are. The aim of the middle is to change places with the high. The aim of the low, when they have an aim, is for it is an abiding characteristic of the low that they are too much crushed by drudgery to be more than intermittently cautious of, conscious of anything outside their daily lives, is to abolish all distinctions and create a society in which all men shall be equal. Thus throughout history, a struggle which is the same in its main outlines recurs over and over again. For long periods, the high seem to be securely in power, but sooner or later, there always comes a moment when they lose either their belief in themselves or their capacity to govern efficiently or both. They are overthrown by the middle, who enlists the low on their side by pretending to them that they are fighting for liberty and justice. As soon as they have reached their objective, the middle thrusts the low back into their old position of servitude, and themselves become the high. Presently, a new middle group splits off from one of the other groups, or from both of them, and the struggle begins over again. Of the three groups, only the low were never even temporarily successful in achieving their aims. It would be an exaggeration to say that throughout history there has been no progress of a material kind. Even today, in a period of decline, the average human being is physically better off than he was a few centuries ago. But no adva advance in wealth, no softening of manners, no reform or revolution has ever brought human equality a millimeter nearer. From the point of view of the low, no historic change has ever meant more than a change in the name of their masters. By the late 19th century, the recurrence of this pattern had become obvious to many observers. Then there rose at the school of thinkers who interpreted history as a cyclical process and claimed to show that inequality was the unalterable law of human life. This doctrine, of course, had always had its adherence, but in the manner in which it was now put forward, there was a significant change. In the past, the need for a hierarchical form of society had been the doctrine specifically of the high. It had been preached by kings and aristocrats and by the priests, lawyers, and the like who were parasitical upon them, and it generally had been softened by promises of compensation in an imaginary world beyond the grave. The middle, so long as it was struggling for power, had always made use of such terms as freedom, justice, and fraternity. Now, however, the concept of human brotherhood began to be assailed by people who were not yet in positions of command, but merely hoped to be so before long. In the past, the middle had made revolutions under the banner of equality, and then it established a fresh tyranny as soon as the old one was overthrown. The new middle group, in effect, proclaimed their tyranny beforehand. Socialism, a theory which appeared in the in early 19th century and was the last link in a chain of thought stretching back to the slave rebellions of antiquity, was still deeply infected by the utopianism of, previous, of past ages. But in each variant of socialism that appeared from about 1900 onward, the aim of establishing liberty and equality was more and more openly abandoned. The new movements which appeared in the middle years of the century, Ingsoc in Oceania, Neo-Bolshevism in Eurasia, Death Worship as it is commonly called in East Asia, had the conscious aim of perpetuating unfreedom and inequality. These new movements, of course, grew out of the old ones intended to keep their names and pay lip service to their ideology. But the purpose of all of them was to arrest progress and freeze history at a chosen moment. The familiar pendulum swing was to happen once more and then stop. As usual, the high were turned out by the middle, who would then become the high. By this time, by conscious strategy, the high would be able to maintain their position permanently. The new doctrines arose partly because of the accumulation of historical knowledge and the growth of the historical sense, which had hardly existed before the 19th century. The cyclical movement of history was now intelligible, or appeared to be so, and if it was intelligible, then it was alterable. But the principal underlying cause was that as early as the beginning of the 20th century, human equality had become technically possible. It was still true that men were not equal in their native talents and that functions had to be specialized in ways that favored some individuals against others. But there was no longer any real need for class distinctions or for large differences of wealth. In earlier ages, class distinctions had not only been inevitable but desirable. Inequality was the price of civilization. With the development of machine production, however, the case was altered. Even if it was still necessary for human beings to do different kinds of work, it was no longer necessary for them to live at different social or economic levels. Therefore, from the point of view of the new groups who were on the point of seizing power, human equality was no longer an ideal to be striven after, but a danger to be averted. In more primitive ages, when a just and peaceful society was in fact not possible, it had been fairly easy to believe it. 
The idea of an earthly paradise in which men should live together in a state of brotherhood, without laws and without brute labor, haunted the human imagination for thousands of years. And this vision had had a certain hold even on the groups who actually profited by each historical change. The heirs of the French, English, and American revolutions had partly believed in their own phase, phrases about the rights of man, freedom, and freedom of speech, equality before the law, and the like, and had even allowed to have their conduct be influenced by them to some extent. By the fourth decade of the 20th century, all the main currents of political thought were authoritarian. The earthly paradise had been discredited at exactly the moment when it became realizable. Even new political theory, by whatever name it called itself, led back to hierarchy and regimentation. And in the general hardening of outlook that set round in about 1930, the practices which had been long abandoned, in some cases for hundreds of years, imprisonment without trial, the use of war prisoners as slaves, public executions, torture to extract confessions, the use of hostages, and the deportation of whole populations, not only became common again, but were tolerated and even defended by people who considered themselves enlightened and progressive. It was only after a decade of national wars, civil wars, revolutions, and counter-revolutions in all parts of the world that Ingsoc and its rivals emerged as fully worked out political theories. But they had been foreshadowed by the various systems, generally called totalitarian, which had appeared earlier in the century and the main outlines of the world which would emerge from the prevailing chaos had, been ob had long been obvious. What kind of people would control this world had been equally obvious. The new aristocracy was made up for the most part of bureaucrats, scientists, technicians, trade union organizers, publicity experts, sociologists, teachers, journalists, and professional politicians. These people, whose origins lay in the salaried middle class and the upper grades of the working class, had been shaped and brought together by the barren world of monopoly, the barren world of monopoly industry and centralized government. As compared with their opposite numbers in past ages, they were less avaricious, less tempted by luxury, hungry for pure power, and above all, more conscious of what they were doing and more intent on crushing opposition. This last difference was cardinal. By comparison with that existing today, all the tyrannies of the past were half-hearted and inefficient. The ruling group was always infected to some extent by liberal ideas and were content to leave loose ends everywhere, to regard only the overt act and to be uninterested in what their subjects were thinking. Even the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages was tolerant by modern standards. Part of the reason for this was that no, in the past, no government had the power to keep its citizens under constant surveillance. The invention of print, however, made it easier to manipulate public opinion, and the film and the radio carried the process further. With the development of television and the technical advance which made it possible to receive and transmit simultaneously on the same instrument, private life came to an end. Every citizen, or at least every citizen important enough to be worth watching, could be kept for 24 hours a day under the eyes of the police and in the sound of official propaganda, with all other channels of communication closed. The possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state, but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. After the revolutionary period of the 50s and 60s, society regrouped itself, as always, into high, middle, and low. But the new high group, unlike its forerunners, did not act upon instinct but knew what was needed to safeguard its position. It had long been realized that the only secure basis for oligarchy is collectivism. Wealth and privilege are most easily defended when they are possessed jointly. The so-called abolition of private property, which took place in the middle years of the century, meant, in effect, the concentration of property in far fewer hands than before. But with this difference, the new owners were a group instead of massive individuals. Individually, no member of the party owns anything, except petty personal belongings. Collectively, the party owns everything in Oceana because it controls everything and disposes of the products as it thinks fit. In the years following the revolution, it was able to step into this commanding position almost unopposed because the whole process had been represented as an act of collectivism. It had always been assumed that if the capitalist class were expropriated, socialism must follow, and unquestionably the capitalists had been expropriated. Factories, mines, lands, houses, transport, everything had been taken away from them. And since these things were no longer private property, it followed that they must be public property. In Ingsoc, which grew out of earlier socialist movements and inherited its phraseology, has in fact carried out the main item in the socialist program, with the result foreseen and intended beforehand that economic inequality has been made permanent. But the problems of perpetuating a hierarchical society go deeper than this. There are only four ways in which a ruling group can fall from power. Either it is conquered from without, or it governs so inefficiently that the masses are stirred to revolt, or it allows a strong and discontented middle group to come into being, or it loses its own self-confidence and willingness to govern. These causes do not operate singly, and as a rule, all four of them are present in some degree. A ruling class which could guard against all of them would remain in power permanently. 
ultimately the determining factor in the mental attitude of the ruling class itself. After the middle of the present century, the first danger had in reality disappeared. Each of the three powers which now divide the world is in fact unconquerable, and could only become conquerable through th slow demographic change, which a government with wide powers can easily avert. The second danger also is only a theoretical one. The masses never revolt of their own accord, and they never revolt merely because they are oppressed. Indeed, so long as they are not permitted to have standards of comparison, they never even become aware that they are oppressed. The recurrent economic crises of past times were totally unnecessary, and are, now not, and are not now permitted to happen, but other and equally large dislocations can and do happen without having political results, because there's no way in which discontent can become articulate. As for the problem of overproduction, which has been latent in our society since the development of machine technique, it is solved by the device of continuous warfare, see chapter 3, which is also useful in keying up public morale to the necessary pitch. From the point of view of our present rulers, therefore, the only genuine dangers are the splitting off of a new group of able, underemployed, power-hungry people, and the growth of liberalism and skepticism in their own ranks. The problem, that is to say, is educational. It is a problem of continuously molding the consciousness both of the directing group and of the larger executive group that lies immediately below it. The consciousness of the masses needs only to be influenced in a negative way. Given this background, one could infer, if one did not know it already, the general structure of oceanic society. At the apex of the pyramid comes Big Brother. Big Brother is infallible and all-powerful. Every success, every achievement, every victory, every scientific discovery, all knowledge, all wisdom, all happiness, all virtue are held to issue directly from his leadership and inspiration. Nobody has ever seen Big Brother. He is a face on the hoardings, a voice on the telescreen. We may be reasonably sure that, it, that he will not never die, and there is already considerable uncertainty as to when he was born. Big Brother is the guise in which the party chooses to exhibit itself to the world. His function is to act as a focusing point for love, fear, and reverence, emotions which are more easily felt toward an individual than toward an organization. Below Big Brother comes the inner party. Its numbers are limited to six millions, or something less than 2% of the population of Oceana. Below the inner party comes the outer party, which, if the inner party is described as the brain of the state, may justly be likened to the hands. Below that comes the dumb masses whom we habitually refer to as the proles, numbering perhaps 85% of the population. In terms of our earlier classification, the proles are the low, for the slave population of the equatorial lands who pass constantly from conqueror to conqueror are not a permanent or necessary, permanent or necessary part of the structure. In principle, membership of these three groups is not hereditary. A child of inner party parents is in theory not born into the inner party. Admission to either branch of the party is by ex examination, taken at age 16. Nor is there any racial discrimination or any marked domination of one province by another. Jews, Negroes, South Americans of pure Indian blood are to be found in the highest ranks of the party, and the administrators of any area are always drawn from the inhabitants of that area. In no part of Oceana do the inhabitants have the feeling that they are a colonial population ruled from a distant capital. Oceana has no capital, and its titular head is a person whose whereabouts nobody knows. Except that English is its chief lingua franca, and New speak its official language, it is not centralized in any way. Its rulers are not held together by blood ties, but by adherence to a common doctrine. It is true that our society is stratified, and very rigidly stratified, on what it, at first sight appears to be hereditary lines. There is far less to and fro movement between the different groups that happen under capitalism, or even in the pre-industrial age. Between the two branches of the party, there is a certain amount of interchange, but only so much as will ensure the weaklings are excluded from the inner party, and that ambitious members of the outer party are made harmless by allowing them to rise. Proletarians, in practice, are not allowed to graduate into the party. The most gifted among them, who might possibly become nuclei of discontent, are simply marked down by the thought police and eliminated. But this state of affairs is not necessarily permanent, nor is it a matter of principle. The party is not a class in the old sense of the word. It does not aim at transmitting power to its own children as such. And if there were no other way of keeping the ablest people at the top, it would per be perfectly prepared to recruit the, an entire new generation from the ranks of the proletariat. In the crucial years, the fact that the party was not a hereditary body did a great deal to neutralize opposition. The older kind of socialist who'd been trained to fight against something called class privilege assumed that what is not hereditary cannot be permanent. He did not see that the continuity of an oligarchy need not be physical, nor did he pause to reflect that hereditary or aristocracies have always been short-lived, whereas adoptive organizations such as the Catholic Church have sometimes lasted for hundreds or thousands of years. The essence of oligarchical rule is not father to son inheritance, but the persistence of certain worldview and a certain way of life, imposed by the dead on, upon the living. A ruling group is a ruling group so long as it can nominate its successors. 
The party is not concerned with perpetuating its blood, but with perpetuating itself. Who wields power is not important, provided that the hierarchical structure remains always the same. All the beliefs, habits, tastes, emotions, mental attitudes that characterize our time are really designed to sustain the mystique of the party and prevent the true nature of present-day society from being perceived. Physical rebellion, or any preliminary move toward rebellion, is at present not possible. From the proletarians, nothing is to be feared. Left to themselves, they will continue from generation to generation and from century to century, working, breeding, and dying, not only without any impulse to rebel, but without the power of grasping that the world could be any other than it is. They could only become dangerous if the advance of industrial technique made it necessary to educate them more highly. But since the military and commercial rivalry are no longer important, the level of popular education is actually declining. What opinions the masses hold or do not hold is looked upon as a matter of indifference. They can be granted, an in, they can be granted intellectual liberty because they have no intellect. In a party member, on the other hand, not even the smallest deviation of opinion on the most unimportant subject can be tolerated. A party member lives from birth to death under the eye of the thought police, and when he's alone, he can never be sure that he is alone. Wherever he may be, awake or asleep, working or resting, in his bath or bed, he can be inspected without warning and without knowing that he's being inspected. Nothing that he does is indifferent. His friendships, his relaxations, his behavior toward his wife and children, the expression of his face when he's alone, the words he mutters in sleep, even the characteristic movements of his body are all jealously scrutinized. Not only any actual misdemeanor, but any eccentricity, however small, any change of habits, any nervous mannerism that could possibly be a symptom of an inner struggle is certain to be detected. He has no freedom of choice in any direction whatever. On the other hand, his actions are not regulated by law or by any clearly formulated code of behavior. In Oceania, there is no law. Thoughts and actions which, when detected, mean certain death are not formally forbidden, and the endless purges, arrests, tortures, imprisonments, and vaporizations are not inflicted as punishment for crimes which have actually been committed, but are merely the wiping out of persons who may perhaps commit a crime at some time in the future. A party member is required not to have only the right opinions, but the right instincts. Many of the beliefs and attitudes demanded of him are never plainly stated, and could not be stated without laying bare the contradictions inherited in Ingsoc. If he is a person naturally orthodox, in new speak, a good thinker, he will in all circumstances know, without taking thought, what is the true belief or the desirable emotion. But in any, any case, an elaborate mental training undergone in childhood and grouping itself around the new speak words crime stock, black, white, and double think make him unwilling and unable to think too deeply on any subject whatever. A party member is expected to have no private emotions and no respite from enthusiasm. He's supposed to live in a continuous frenzy of hatred of foreign enemies and internal traitors, triumph over victories, and self-abasement before the power and wisdom of the party. The discontents produced by his bare, unsatisfying life are deliberately turned outwards and dissipated by such devices as the two minutes of hate. The speculations which might possibly induce skeptical or rebellious attitude are killed in advance by his early acquired inner discipline. The first and simplest stage in the discipline, which can be taught even to young children, is called in Newspeak, Crime Stop. Crime stop means the faculty of stopping short, as though by instinct, at the threshold of any dangerous thought. It includes the power of not grasping analogies, of failing to perceive logical errors, of misunderstanding the simplest arguments if they are inimical to Ingsoc, and of being bored or repelled by any train of thought which is capable of leading in a her heretical direction. Crime stop, in short, means protective stupidity, but stupidity is not enough. On the contrary, orthodoxy in the full sense demands a control over one's own mental processes, as complete as that of a contortionist over his body. Oceanic society rests ultimately on the belief that Big Brother is omnipotent and that the party is infallible. But since in reality Big Brother is not omnipotent and the party is not infallible, there is need for an unwearying moment-to-moment -moment flexibility in the treatment of facts. The key word here is black-white. Like so many many new speak words, this word has two mutually contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent means the habit of imprudently suggesting that black is white, in contradiction of the plain facts. Applied to a party member, it means loyal willingness to say that black is white when party discipline demands this. But it means also the ability to believe that black is white, and more to know that black is white, and to forget that one has ever believed the contrary. This demands a continuous alteration of the past made possible by a system of thought which really embraces all the rest and which is known in Newspeak as doublethink. The alteration of the past is necessary for two reasons, one of which is subsidiary and, so to speak, precautionary. The subsidiary response is that the party member, like the proletarian, tolerates present-day conditions partly because he has no standards of comparison. 
He must cut off from the past, just as he must cut off from foreign countries, because it is necessary for him to believe that he is better off than his ancestors, that the average level of material comfort is constantly rising. But by far the most important reason for the readjustment of the past is the need to safeguard the infallibility of the party. It is not merely that speeches, statistics, and records of every kind must be constantly brought up to date in order to show that the predictions of the party were in all cases right. It is also that no change in doctrine or any political alignment can ever be admitted. For to change one's mind or even one's policy is a confession of weakness. If, for example, Eurasia or East Asia, whichever it might be, is the enemy today, then that country must have always been the enemy. And if the facts say otherwise, then the facts must be altered. Thus, history is continuously rewritten. This day-to-day -day falsification of the past, carried out by the Ministry of Truth, is as necessary to the stability of the regime as the work of repression and espionage carried out by the Ministry of Love. The mutability of the past is the central tenet of Amosok. Past events, it is argued, have no objective existence, but survive only in written records and in human memories. The past is whatever the records and the memories agree upon. And since the party is in full control of all records and in equally full control of the minds of its members, it follows that the past is whatever the party chooses to make it. It also follows that though the past is alterable, it never has been altered in any specific instance. And when it has been recreated in whatever shape is needed at the moment, then this new version is the past, and no different past can have ever existed. This holds good even when, as often happens, the same event has to be altered out of recognition several times in the course of the year. At all times, the party is in possession of absolute truth, and clearly the absolute can never have been different from what it is now. It will be seen that the control of the past depends upon all the training of memory. To make sure that all written records agree with the orthodoxy of the moment is merely a mechanical act. But it is also necessary to remember that events happen in the desired manner. And if it is necessary to rearrange one's memories or to tamper with written records, it is necessary to forget that one has done so. The trick of doing this can be learned like any other mental technique. It is learned by the majority of party members and certainly by all who are intelligent as well as orthodox. In old speak, it is called, quite frankly, reality control. In noon speak, it is called doublethink, though doublethink comprises much else as well. Doublethink means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. The party intellectual knows in which direction his memories must be altered. He therefore knows that he is playing tricks with reality, but by the exercise of doublethink, he also satisfies himself that reality is not violated. The process has to be conscious, or it would not be carried out with sufficient precision, but it also has to be unconscious or it would bring with it a feeling of falsity and hence of guilt. Double thing lies at the very heart of Ingsoc, since the essential act of the party is to use conscious deception while retaining the firmness of purpose that goes with complete honesty, to tell deliberate lies while genuinely believing in them, to forget any fact that has become inconvenient, and then when it becomes necessary again to drop back from oblivion for just so long as it is needed, to deny the existence of objective reality and all the while to take account of the reality which one denies, all of this is indispensably necessary. Even in using the word doublethink, it is necessary to exercise doublethink. For by using the word, one admits that one is tampering with reality. By a fresh act of doublethink, one erases this knowledge, and so, and so on indefinitely, with the lie always one leap ahead of the truth. Ultimately, it is by means of doublethink that the party has been able, and may, for all we know, continue to be able for thousands of years, to arrest the course of history. All past oligarchies have fallen from power either because they ossified or because they grew soft. Either they became stupid and arrogant, failed to adjust themselves to changing circumstances, and were overthrown, or they became liberal and cowardly, made concessions when they should have used force, and once again were overthrown. They fell, that is to say, either through consciousness or through unconsciousness. It is the achievement of the party that to have produced a system of thought in which both conditions can exist simultaneously, and upon no other intellectual basis could the dominion of the party be made permanent. If one is to rule and to continue ruling, one must be able to dislocate the sense of reality. For the secret of rulership is to combine a belief in one's own infallibility with the power to learn from past mistakes. It need hardly be said that the subtlest practitioners of doublethink are those who invented doublethink and know that it is a vast system of mental cheating. In our society, those who have the best knowledge of what is happening are also those who are furthest from seeing the world as it is. In general, the greater the understanding, the greater the delusion. The more intelligent, the less sane. One clear illustration of this is the fact that war hysteria increases in intensity as one rises in the social scale. That whose attitude toward the war is most nearly rational are the subject peoples of the disputed territories. To these people, the war is simply a continuous calamity which sweeps to and fro over their bodies like a tidal wave. Which side is winning is a matter of complete indifference to them. 
They are aware that a change in overlordship means simply that they will be doing the same work as before for new masters who will treat them in the same manner as the old ones. The slightly more favored workers, whom we call the proles, are only intermittently conscious of the war. When it is necessary, they can be prodded into frenzies of fear and hatred, but when left to themselves, they are capable of forgetting for long periods that the war is happening. It is in the ranks of the party, and above all the inner party, that the true war enthusiasm is found. World conquest is believed in most firmly by those who know it to be impossible. This peculiar linking together of opposites, knowledge with ignorance, cynicism with fanaticism, is one of the chief distinguishing marks of oceanic society. The official ideology abounds with contradictions, even when there is no practical reason for them. Thus, the party rejects and vilifies every principle for which the socialist movement is originally stood, and it chooses to do this in the name of socialism. It preaches a contempt for the working class, unexampled for centuries past, and it dresses its members in a uniform which was at one time peculiar to manual workers and was adopted for that reason. It systematically undermines the solidarity of the family, and it calls its leader by a name which is a direct appeal to the sentiment of family loyalty. Even the names of the four ministries by which we are governed exhibit a sort of impudence in their deliberate reversal of the facts. The Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war, the Ministry of Truth with lies, the Ministry of Love with torture, and the Ministry of Plenty with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental, nor do they result from ordinary hypocrisy. They are deliberate exercises in doublethink, for it is only by reconciling contradictions that power can be retained indefinitely. In no other way could the ancient cycle be broken. If human equality is to be forever averted, if the high, as we have called them, are to keep their places permanently, then the prevailing mental condition must be controlled, must be controlled in sanity. But there is one question which until this moment we have almost ignored. It is, why should human equality be averted? Supposing that the mechanics of the process have been rightly described, what is the motive for this huge, accurately planned effort to freeze history at a particular moment of time? Here we reach the central secret. As we have seen, the mystique of the party, and above all the inner party, depends upon doublethink. But deeper than this lies the original motive, the never-questioned instinct that first led to the seizure of power and brought doublethink, the thought police, continuous warfare, and all the other necess necessary paraphernalia into existence afterwards. This motive really consists, Winston became aware of silence, as one becomes aware of a new sound. It seemed to him that Julia had been very still for some time past. She was lying on her side, naked from the waist upwards, with her cheek pillowed on her hand and one dark lock tumbling across her eyes. Her breast rose and fell slowly and regularly. Julia, no answer. Julia, are you awake? No answer. She was asleep. He shut the book, put it carefully on the floor, lay down and pulled the coverlet over both of them. He had still, he reflected, not learned the ultimate secret. He understood how, but he did not understand why. Chapter one, like chapter three, had not actually told him anything that he did not know. It had merely systemized the knowledge that he possessed already. But after reading it, he knew better than before that he was not mad. Being in a minority, even a minority of one, did not make you mad. There was truth and there was untruth. And if you clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. A yellow beam from the sinking sun slanted in through the window and fell across the pillow. He shut his eyes. The sun on his face and the girl's smooth body touching his own gave him a strong, sleepy, confident feeling. He was safe. Everything was all right. He fell asleep, murmuring, sanity is not statistical, with the feeling that this remark contained in it a profound wisdom. When he woke, it was with the sensation of having slept for a long time, but a glance at the old-fashioned clock told him that it was only 20.30. He lay dozing for a while, then the usual deep-lunged singing started up from the yard below. It was only a hopeless fancy, it passed like an April dye, but a look and a word and the dreams that they stirred have stolen my heart a why. The driveling song seemed to have kept its popularity. You still heard it all over the place. It had outlived the hate song. Julia woke at the sound, stretched herself luxur luxuriously, and got out of bed. I'm hungry, she said. Let's make some more coffee. Damn, the stove's got out and the water's cold. She picked up the stove and shook it. There's no oil in it. We can get some from old Charrington, I expect. The funny thing is, I made sure it was full. I'm going to put my clothes on, she added. It seems to have got colder. Winston also got up and dressed himself. The indefatigable voice sang on. They say that time heals all things. They say you can always forget. But the smiles and the tears across the years, they twist my heartstrings yet. As he fastened the belt of his overalls, he strolled across to the window. The sun must have gone down behind the houses. It was not shining into the yard any longer. The flagstones were wet as though they had just been washed, and he had the feeling that the sky had been washed too. So fresh and pale was the blue between the chimney pots. 
Tirelessly, the woman marched to and fro, corking and uncorking herself, singing and falling silent, and pegging out more diapers and more and yet more. He wondered whether she took in washing for a living or was merely a, the slave of 20 or 30 grandchildren. Julia had come across to his side. Together they gazed down with a sort of fascination at the sturdy figure below. As he looked at the woman in her characteristic attitude, her thick arms reaching up for the line, her powerful mare-like buttocks protruding, it struck him for the first time that she was beautiful. It had never before occurred to him that the body of a woman of 50, blown up to the monstrous dimensions by childbearing, then hardened, roughened by work till it was coarse in the grain like an overripe, turn, overripe turnip, could be beautiful. But it was so. And after all, he thought, why not? The solid, contourless body like a block of granite, the rasping red skin, bore the same relation to the body of a girl as the rose hip to the rose. Why should the fruit be held inferior to the flower? She's beautiful, he murmured. She's a meter across the hips easily, said Julia. That is her style of beauty, said Winston. He held Julia's supple waist, easily encircled by his arm. From the hip to the knee, her flank was against his. Out of their bodies, no child would ever come. That was the one thing they could never do. Only by word of mouth, from mind to mind, could they pass on the secret. The woman down there had no mind. She only had strong arms, a warm heart, and a fertile belly. He wondered how many children she had given birth to. It might easily be 15. She had had her momentary flowering, a year, perhaps, of wild rose beauty, and then she had suddenly swollen like a fertilized fruit and grown hard and red and coarse, and then her life had been laundering, scrubbing, darning, cooking, sweeping, polishing, mending, scrubbing, laundering, first for children, then for grandchildren, over thirty unbroken years. And yet, the, at the end of it, she was still singing. The mystical reverence that he felt for her was somehow mixed up with the aspect of the pale, cloudless sky, stretching away behind the chimney pots into interminable distance. It was curious to think that the sky was the same for everybody in Eurasia or East Asia as well as here, and the people under the sky were also very much the same. Everywhere, all over the world, hundreds of thousands of millions of people just like this, people ignorant of one another's existence, held apart by walls of hatred and lies, and yet almost exactly the same, people who had never learned to think but who were storing up in their hearts and bellies and muscles the power that would one day overturn the world. If there was hope, it lay with the proles. Without having read to the end of the book, he knew that must be what Goldstein's final, that must be Goldstein's final message. The future belonged to the proles. And could he be sure that when their time came, the world they constructed would not be just as alien to him, Winston Smith, as the world of the party? Yes, because at the least it would be a world of sanity. Where there is equality, there can be sanity. Sooner or later, it would happen. Strength would change into consciousness. The proles were immortal. You could not doubt it when you looked at that valiant figure in the yard. In the end, their awakening would come, and until that happened, though it might be a thousand years, they would stay alive against all the odds, like birds pressing, passing on from body to body the vitality which the party did not share and could not kill. Do you remember, he said, the thrush that sang to us that first day at the edge of the wood? He wasn't singing to us, said Julia. He was singing to please himself. Not even that. He was just singing. The birds sang. The proles sang. The party did not sing. All around the world, in London and New York, in Africa and Brazil, in the mysterious forbidden lands beyond the frontiers, in the streets of Paris and Berlin, in the villages of the endless Russian plain, in the bazaars of China and Japan, everywhere stood the same solid, unconquerable figure, made monstrous by work and childbearing, toiling from birth to death and still singing. Out of those mighty loins, a race of consciousness, conscious beings must one day come. You were the dead, theirs was the future. But you could share in that future if you kept alive the mind as they kept alive the body and passed on the secret doctrine that two plus two make four. We are the dead, he said. We are the dead, echoed Julia dutifully. You are the dead, said an iron voice behind them. They sprang apart. Winston's entrails seemed to have turned into ice. He could see the white all around the irises of Julia's eyes. Her face had turned a milky yellow. The smear of rouge that was still on each cheekbone stood out sharply, almost as though unconnected with the skin beneath. You are the dead, repeated the iron voice. It was behind the picture, breathed Julia. It was behind the picture, said the voice. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. It was starting. It was starting at last. They could do nothing except stand gazing into one another's eyes. To run for life, to get out of the house before it was too late, no such thought occurred to them. Unthinkable to disobey the iron voice from the wall. There was a snap as though a catch had been turned back and a crash of breaking glass. The picture had fallen to the floor and covering the telescreen behind it. Now they can see us, said Julia. Now we can see you, said the voice. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. 
clasp your hands behind your heads. Do not touch one another. They were not touching, but it seemed to him that he could feel Julia's body shaking. Or perhaps it was merely the shaking of his own. He could just stop his teeth from chattering, but his knees were beyond his control. There was a sound of trampling boots below, inside the house and outside. The yard seemed to be full of men. Something was being dragged across the stones. The woman singing had stopped abruptly. There was a long rolling clang as though the washtub had been flung across the yard, and then a confusion of angry shouts which ended in a yell of pain. The house is surrounded, said Winston. The house is surrounded, said the voice. He heard Julia snap her teeth together. I suppose we may as well say goodbye, she said. You may as well say goodbye, said the voice. And then another quite different voice, a thin cultivated voice, which Winston had the impression of having heard before, struck in. And by the way, while we are on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Something crashed onto the bed behind Winston's back. The head of a ladder had been thrust through the window and had burst into the frame. Someone was climbing through the window. There was a stampede of boots up the stairs. The room was full of solid men in black uniforms with iron shod boots on their feet and truncheons in their hands. Winston was, no, was not trembling any longer. Even his eyes, he barely moved. One thing alone mattered, to keep still, to keep still, and not give them an excuse to hit you. A man with a smooth prize fighter's jowl in which the mouth was only a slit paused opposite him, balancing his truncheon meditatively between thumb and forefinger. Winston met his eyes. The feeling of nakedness, with one's hand behind one's head and one's face and body all exposed, was almost unbearable. The man protruded the tip of a white tongue, licked the place where his lips should have been, and then passed on. There was another crash. Someone had picked up the glass paperweight from the table and smashed it to pieces on the hearthstone. The fragment of coral, a tiny crinkle of pink like, pink like a sugar rosebud from a cake, rolled across the mat. How small, thought Winston. How small it always was. There was a gasp and a thump behind him, and he received a violent kick on the ankle, which nearly flung him off his balance. One of the men had smashed his fist into Julia's solar plexus, doubling her up like a pocket ruler. See, she was thrashing about on the floor, fighting for breath. Winston dared not turn his head even by a millimeter, but sometimes her livid, gasping face came within the angle of his vision. Even in his terror, it was as though he could feel the pain in his own body, the deadly pain which nevertheless was less urgent than the struggle to get back her breath. He knew what it was like, the terrible, agonizing pain which that was there all the while, but could not be suffered yet, because before all else it was necessary to be able to breathe. Then two of the men hoisted her up by the knees and shoulders and carried her out of the room like a sack. Winston had a glimpse of her face, upside down, yellow and contorted, with the eyes shut and still with a smear of rouge on either cheek. That was the last he saw of her. He, soon he stood dead still. No one had hit him yet. Thoughts which came of their own accord but seemed totally uninteresting began to flit through his mind. He wondered whether they had got Mr. Charrington. He wondered what they had done to the woman in the yard. He noticed that he badly wanted to urinate and felt a faint surprise because he had done so only two or three hours ago. He noticed that the clock on the mantelpiece said nine, meaning 21, but the light seemed too strong. Would not the light be fading at 21 hours on an August evening? He wondered whether, after all, he and Julia had mistaken the time. He had slept the clock round and thought it was 20.30 when it really was not 8.30 on the following morning. But he did not pursue the thought further. It was not interesting. There was another lighter step on the passage. Mr. Charrington came into the room. The demeanor of the black uniformed men suddenly became more subdued. Something had also changed in Mr. Charrington's appearance. His eye fell on the fragments of the glass paperweight. Pick up those pieces, he said sharply. A man stooped to obey. The Cockney accent had disappeared. Winston suddenly realized whose voice it was that he had heard a few moments ago in the telescreen. Mr. Charrington was still wearing his old velvet jacket, but his hair, which had been almost white, had turned black. Also, he was not wearing his spectacles. He gave Winston a single sharp glance as though verifying his ident identity and then paid no more attention to him. He was still recognizable, but he was not the same person any longer. His body had straightened. He seemed to have grown bigger. His face had undergone only tiny changes that had nonetheless worked a complete transformation. The black eyebrows were less bushy, the wrinkles were gone, and the whole lines of his face seemed to have altered. Even the nose seemed shorter. It was the alert, cold face of a man about five and thirty. It occurred to Winston that for the first time in his life, he was looking, with knowledge, at a member of the Thought Police.